Okay, today, uh, I don't know if anyone would be surprised, but we are going to be reading in the Gospel of Luke today, okay? And we've been here for a while. We've been camping out in Luke, and we will for a couple more months as we work our way through it. And we're getting, though, into fun parts. I mean, it's all fun, but we're uh, encountering now some of Jesus' teaching in the form of parables. And this is when that which is mysterious of the kingdom of God is uh, being made known to us who are followers of Jesus, and he's, he's teaching us. And so today's sermon, we have a lot of uh, ground to cover. We're going to be in chapter 8 of the Gospel of Luke, starting at verse 1. And we're going to read, by the time I'm done, I'll have read uh, 21 verses, but I'm going to break it up. I'm going to break it up into about six different parts. So uh, we will uh, work our way through it, but God is good, and we need to pray. So let us pray. God, we give you thanks for the gift of your word, Lord, that it is a lamp to our feet, a light for our path, that your word is a seed to be planted in our lives, not that it would grow and wither, Lord, but that this seed of your kingdom would grow and mature, and more than mature, that it would bear fruit, fruit that would last, that is you. So, Lord, we thank you, and we praise you, and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, to begin, I'll read chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Now, Herod was the king. And Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So the first thing that we see here is that we're picking up Jesus on the move. Jesus in his ministry is mobile. He's not uh, coming from headquarters every moment, every uh, morning, but every day he is beginning in someone's home and residing in the neighborhood and then moving on to a new neighborhood. And we're familiar with the twelve because we've seen how Jesus has called them and, and they've begun to follow. But what's remarkable about Luke is how he reminds us about the women that are supporting this ministry. And it's really the women who seem to be the backbone of this operation because of their contributions and the ways that they are supporting the itinerant ministry of Jesus and his followers. And clearly, they've been affected. They've been healed. They have, uh, their lives have been transformed by his ministry. And what does it say? It says that he was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. As we've been reading through Luke, you might recall that he talks about what his purpose has been. It's been to proclaim this good news and to bring amazing healing to those who are having difficulty, to bring freedom to the captives, to uh, bring relief to those who would be suffering, to proclaim, as he would quote from Isaiah, the year of the Lord's favor— And Jesus very much is rooted in the tradition of Israel and the Old Testament. So when he's talking about the kingdom of God, he's not talking about something that is a new concept for the nation here. Okay, you see they have a long history of prophets and of teaching the the revealed uh, law that they had been given. All of this was so that they would have as their king God, who was their leader. And in that, we hear words from prophets who call the nation to correction. And uh, in a number of places, there are uh, words of judgment, as well as words of love. We're challenged when we read the Bible, uh, as we read God's word, because sometimes our concept of who God is doesn't line up with Scripture. And that might mean that our concept needs to change. Sometimes 
we've thought of God as a God of love. After all, the Bible says that. But what does it mean that God is a God of love? Does it mean that if God is a God of love, then, then he is not also a God of justice and righteousness, a God of wrath, a God of judgment? Is it possible that these things are at odds with one another, or is it more likely that they are all part of one holy character of God? As Ken read earlier in the, in the call to worship, that his, his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts higher than our thoughts. So how is it that we understand this God, not of our own creation, but the God of the universe who is before us and his kingdom in this world? Well, sometimes we hear a word from God that is, as C.S. Lewis would put it, good, but not safe. That's kind of what today's reading is like. It is a good word, but it's a little bit dangerous because it calls forth from us something of our lives. You see, the gospel the kingdom of God, any, any news about this, this good news that Jesus proclaims, it always demands a response. It always demands a response. It isn't enough just that it would land on us, but we must respond in some way. So let me continue in the reading at chapter 8, verses 4 to the beginning of verse 8. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell upon the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. Something about stories and hearing stories like this, right? How many of you have heard this story before? This isn't a new one, right? Okay, that's what I was afraid of. <laughs> you see, when we've heard a story, sometimes we begin to hear the story again, and we go, oh, I've heard that story before. I know how it goes. I can shut my brain off now, right? I know the end of this one. It's kind of like when I hear stories from my dad, right? <laughs> now you've been there, maybe you were a storyteller or maybe you were a story hearer in your family, but when I was young, my dad would start to tell a story. I had heard it before. He'd told it before. I knew the story, and I would get a little bit annoyed. Just something about growing up as a kid that your parents are just annoying sometimes. <laughs> and I, I get to be that annoying parent these days because uh, I've got, you know, two boys who just kind of look at me and go, oh, no, not again. Except that now when I hear my dad's stories, I've, yes, likely heard them before, but I listen again because I've come to, to realize that it's not just about the story. It's also about who I'm listening to because I'm grateful that I have a relationship with my dad, that I can hear the stories that he wants to say again. And maybe when he tells the story, it's not so much the story that I need to hear again, it's my dad that I need to know at a deeper level to hear again. Isn't that true with the Word of God? That when we come to it, and maybe we've heard uh, a familiar story over and over again, that we must not turn our ears off, saying, I've already heard this one. But we must be ready for what a relationship with our Father in Heaven will bring to us in a fresh and new and powerful way because the kingdom of God is always breaking forth. It is always new. It is always bringing transformation before us. And so, with that, we look at this story, which is a parable. Parable literally means, in the Greek, to throw next to, okay? To kind of throw something next to something else. So a parable is a story that Jesus is using next to real life as he's teaching about the kingdom of God to describe what it means to be a good listener and a good hearer of this word, which he talks about later. Uh, he, he explains it a little bit in detail. Now, using, an agricu using agricultural kinds of stories may, may not be something we use a lot, 
but it was something that definitely is biblical. And when we look in the Old Testament, we see many, many times when there are accounts where God is tending a garden of some kind. And in particular, there's one uh, where in Isaiah chapter 5, we see that there is a vineyard. And the one, the vine dresser, the one who is in charge of this vineyard is the Lord. God is the one who clears the field of all of the rocks. It is the God who plants the vines. It is God who puts up a hedge and a wall around it to protect it, all for the purpose of producing grapes and good ones. Except that in the story in Isaiah chapter 5, it doesn't produce good grapes. It produces bad grapes. This vineyard of Israel, of whom God is supposed to be their king, has gone its own way. And the fruit of their lives is not righteousness or goodness, but it is injustice and oppression. And so what does God do? Does he just happily kind of continue to bless them and walk alongside them? No. He knocks down the wall. He knocks down the hedge. He does not tend to this vineyard anymore because it has not produced good grapes. It doesn't seem like it's the word of a loving God. It seems like it's about wrath and judgment. How could that be? Yet, in order to really understand God, we have to know him in his full holiness. And that he will not stand by as his people do what is wrong. And so, Israel receives judgment as described by the prophet Isaiah. It says that the mouth of Sheol opens up wide for these people. Ho, ho! That is an image of judgment. Yet there is always hope in the prophets. It's never just about the God who will smite. It is always about the God who will persevere and preserve a a part of his people to continue to live in faithfulness. There will always be a stump out of which a seed can grow and a new plant will thrive so that God's kingdom and word and people will flourish so the land can be healed. In Jeremiah chapter 4, Jeremiah writes, Break up your unplowed ground and do not sow among thorns. Maybe this was something that would have been heard back in that day as Jesus talked about this sower who sows seed. This uh, parable of the sower might just as well be known as the parable of the soils because of the instruction that we receive on each type of soil that Jesus offers to us. So I'll continue reading now. As now Jesus explains a little bit about his theory of education and of listening and hearing. When he had said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. And he said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. He quotes in this, at the very end here, this, though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand, he quotes from Isaiah in chapter 6, which is the exact same chapter of the Bible that our anthem was sung from, that the choir just sang. Here I am, Lord. So maybe you remember Isaiah. He tells this horrible story about this vineyard and and the, the judgment of the people, and then immediately he hears this call from God. Maybe you remember this story as well. There he is in the temple, and the smoke uh, of God fills the temple, and there's angels flying, and, and Isaiah is afraid, but God says, you know, don't worry, I'm going to heal you, I'm going to make you, you know, a, a good prophet. And then Isaiah, I'm paraphrasing, and then Isaiah says, oh gosh, I don't know if I can do it, I'm an unclean man, among an unclean people. No, G- and then uh, God says, who will go for me? And Isaiah says, I will, here I am, Lord. 
send me. And that's where the, the anthem came from. Now, this is a song that was sung at my ordination. It's one where uh, I always have fond thoughts about this song. It's a wonderful song about mission and going out and serving the Lord and being equipped for it. Who's going to go? I'm going to go. Yeah! And it's a kind of an exciting rah-rah, like, yeah! Except the ne very next thing when Isaiah says, well, what am I supposed to say? God says, okay, tell everyone to listen up, but they're not going to understand. And not only that, um, I'm basically going to destroy most of the people, yet preserve a small number of them, because there will be a stump of which this people can grow from again in faithfulness. See, Isaiah is given a very difficult task to preach to a people who will not hear. Their hearts will have been hardened. Kind of like the soil that the seed gets cast upon. And so Jesus, his theory of education has everything to do with the condition of our listening and our hearing. And how is it, too, that we need God to help us in our listening and in our hearing so that the seed of the word of God does not just sit on us, but that it sprouts and then grows deep and then produces fruit in our lives. You see, the alternative is that if we do not respond accordingly, that we will face a certain judgment, a certain extinguishment, a certain fire of consequence that likely we don't see coming, but which, if we were to be judged merely by our sin and not by the grace of Jesus Christ, we would die. Yet God always gives hope. He says that the secrets of the kingdom of God, the mysteries that have been hidden, have not been hidden from you. They have been made known. That which was unknown has now been made known. And we who know the rest of the story realize that Jesus Christ is the one we need to know. There are no secrets kept from us anymore. That which we need to know is made fully for us in Christ. We can lean on him and his revelation and his grace. His grace is sufficient, as Paul writes. So let us continue in this reading as Jesus explains what's going on. This is the meaning of the parable, he said. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way they are choked by life's worries and riches and pleasures. They do not mature. But the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. It's a little bit scary because there are tests that will show whether or not we've really heard. There will, tests, there will be tests in our lives that will demonstrate whether our ears we're here for hearing, or whether they were just kind of here and not hearing. The first one, the seed falls on the path, and he explains something about the devil. The birds represent the devil taking away the seed that is not even there long enough to sprout. And whenever we read about the devil or we hear about it, you know, as Presbyterians, people start to get a little nervous, right? Uh oh, he's talking about the devil again. Well, if Jesus talks about the devil, and there's an account in Luke that it talks about Jesus' experience with the devil, which you might recall, he is baptized, and then he is taken into the wilderness where he is tempted. Well, if all of this is something that's important to be recounted from the life of Jesus, then don't you think we ought to be paying attention? that the first thing after Jesus is baptized, he goes into the wilderness and faces these uh, temptations after he's been fasting and praying 
The only thing that sustains him is the actual real word of God that has been planted deep in him. So that when the devil does come to destroy and to snatch and to try and tempt him away from his mission, the devil fails. You see, the devil never has the amount of power that we think he has. But if the word of God is planted deep in us, and we allow it to sprout and to grow and to to bear fruit in our lives, the devil will be powerless against us. But it does not mean that there won't be attacks and trials for us. You see, the one who would have the seed snatched away would be the one who is kind of shown up and come and heard and just kind of gone, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people say a lot of different things. And then it doesn't grow. Yet the kingdom of God, Jesus would say, is like more like a seed than the kingdoms of this world. You see, a seed begins deep in somewhere and begins to grow slowly over time. And it usually will be many, many uh, amounts of time longer than we would think. It isn't an instant transformation, but over time, especially as we are students of the Word of God, and it does become a part of who we are, we will produce fruit in our lives. Tim Keller has made this observation about the difference between earthly leaders and Jesus, who leads a kingdom not of this world. Tim Keller says that earthly kingdoms always come through coercion and force. They never come through hearing. He continues, earthly leaders almost always are great at getting a hearing, but the kingdom of God comes to people who are good at giving a hearing. Did you catch that? Earthly leaders almost always are great at getting a hearing, but the kingdom of God comes to people who are good at giving a hearing. Church, are you learning more and more how to give a hearing to the word of God, to hear these stories afresh, to not go away from God's word, but to be ministered to by it? So that's the path. Seed can be trampled and can be eaten, but the the seeds could also land in the landscaping. You know, maybe you have rocks in your yard like I do in mine, and it doesn't, it just sits there. There's a sprout, but then there's nowhere for the roots to grow. Well, that's no good. Or there is some seed that lands in the weeds where they get choked out by worries and troubles. Do you know anyone that's troubled by worries these days? Or fears? Karl Barth, the famous theologian, is known for his saying that we need to hold the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Because we need to know what's going on in the world so that we can apply the word of God to the situations of this world. My sense, though, is that today a lot of people are reading the newspaper or Facebook or favorite news outlet on TV and not really reading the word. Do you spend as much time in your life reading Facebook, the newspaper, uh, watching television news as you do reading the word of God? Well, I think sometimes if that's not true, maybe we have life backwards. That it should be the word of God that is being stirred and planted and read and lived. Seeds sown to produce real fruit from our lives instead of all of the reactions that we seem to produce. And the church in America is almost a bad example of how to be followers of the word of God these days. Finally, there's good soil. Good soil is the place where seeds belong, and it's where things are produced. All right, next reading. Verse 16, no one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, it will be taken from them. Friends, be careful 
about what you think you have in your life. And make sure you test it against the word of God so that it is the true thing that you have in your life. For if you have God producing good fruit in your life, then we will not hide it, but we will set it out so that we might proclaim the goodness of our God in this world. You see, the good soil produces people who hear and retain this word and persevere through difficulties. It's not a matter of if there will be difficulties. It's a matter of when those difficulties will come. We'll all have to go through things that are difficult. We are not entitled to an easy life or a comfortable path, but we are given grace, which is light to be put on a stand. Our lives, an example to others of what God can do in bringing transformation. And then finally, verse 19 and 20 and 21. Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. Jesus replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Now friends, what Jesus is not saying here is that you should go and disrespect your family. Okay, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying, go ahead and put anything you want on Facebook, no matter what someone will think of it. Truth at all costs kind of thing. That's not what he's saying. Even if you disagree with your mom, do it kindly to her face. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, listen to God. Listen to his word. Let his seed be planted deep in your heart that it would bring understanding retention, perseverance, and produce. And when you do this, you will discover you are part of a much bigger family of people who are doing the same thing. You will see that your family likeness is more in the image of your brother Jesus, according to the will of your Father in heaven, with brothers and sisters who you never thought would be a part of your family. Your brothers and sisters are all those who do God's will. Letting transformation in the seed of God's word grow. I'm going to finish by reading the same scripture that was read as our call to worship. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and the bread for the eater, so is my word that goes from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You see, in many ways, God's will and the accomplishment of it does not depend on our listening. It solely depends on God. Solely upon the Holy Spirit. But would you rather be a part of what God is doing? and producing fruit in your life, bringing transformation to our community and our kingdom. Be a part of sharing that goodness and good news of the kingdom of God as it breaks in and shines light in this community. I'd rather be a part of that. Let us pray. O oh Lord, will you accomplish in us what you desire? Will you achieve the purposes that you set before us, for us? The dreams that you have for us, O oh God, may they come to fruition by our obedience. O oh Lord, we as sinners will fail, but by the grace of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, the sending of your Holy Spirit, Lord, all of these things make it possible to do what is impossible. So Lord, change us. Help us to not just respond emotionally and excitedly, but Lord, use that to produce a good soil in us, that we would continue to return to your word each day, hearing your stories over and over and over again. For your story will not change, your word does not change, but our relationship with you, O oh Lord, will grow and change and deepen. O oh Lord, will you make it possible? Show us what's next. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.